All right, go ahead and take out your Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of Exodus, chapter number 20. Exodus, chapter number 20. We're continuing our... Uh oh, what was that, Brother Danny? <laughs> oh, okay. So, see, this is one of those situations. All right. Uh, I, I don't look up what everyone's working on uh, Sunday school. I don't. And, and Brother Danny just said, I guess they were looking at Exodus 20 in their Sunday school this morning. So, it's one of those things the music, uh, a conversation on the front porch, uh, a Sunday school. So, buckle up because here it comes. Okay. Uh, obviously, this is what we need this morning. We're, we're continuing this series that we started over the last few weeks called Gaskins Ask It. And this is a series, as I've said, as I set it up each week, this is a series that you helped to write. And the you that I mean is you that submitted questions over the last few months. We had a jar in the foyer and it says, if you've got Bible questions, submit those here and I'll try to answer them. And so we've got eight weeks. We're going to be going through this series answering some of those questions. Some of them are common questions that a number of people asked. Some were very unique that, you know, maybe only one person asked. Uh, and so we're going, to, we're going to look at those, and we may not get to all of them, because in all honesty, between questions that the youth had submitted, because they submitted some to their youth leaders, and those were given to me, and then the questions that were submitted in the jar here, we probably had 30 or 40 questions. And so I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. We may do like a lightning round, and I didn't mean that because of the storm right now, but uh, we may do like a lightning round later towards the end of the series where maybe I try to just, you know, give you a quick answer, a two-minute answer to a question without a ton of explanation to say, go study that on your own, you know. But uh, we'll, we'll look at that as we go. But uh, uh, we want to continue this series, uh, Gaskins Ask and Answering Some of These Questions. And, you know, this morning, when you hear me speak this morning on the topic for which I'm going to speak, if you've been around here at any, any amount of time, you're going to know that I am passionate about this topic. And that is the church. I am passionate about the church. I am passionate about being faithful to church. I am passionate about getting involved in church and, and using the talents and the gifts that the Lord has blessed you with to be a blessing to others. You know, sometimes folks show up to church with this attitude, bless me if you can. Like, you know, hey, it's your job to try to break through this hard exterior and bless me if you can. And so it's all about give to me if you can even get in. And honestly, if we would change our mindset on why we come to church and how we come to church, it would revolutionize so many things about our own personal lives and our families and even our church, our community, and it would go on and on outside of that. Because if instead of showing up to church saying, you know what, hey, what do you have for me today? And then maybe, maybe even some that would come and hardened and say, bless me if you can't break through this next year if you can. If we would change and come and say, what can I do for somebody else today? Hey, if we all showed up trying to be a blessing to somebody else, you know what's going to happen? We're all going to get our needs met. We're, we're all going to be blessed, but also we're going to be a blessing to somebody else. And, and I don't know, for me personally, I mean, there, there are certainly days where I need a blessing. Like I, I need somebody to say that word of encouragement. I need someone to lift me up. Uh, there are those days, absolutely. And, and it's always great when that comes. But you know what I found, especially the older I get, you know, I'm, I'm getting to be a bit of an old man now. <laughs> And so the older I get, yes, I, I was telling Wes in my office earlier, I said, we were talking about Zach and Sadie's wedding. I said, I, I was just talking about them. I said, they're just, they're just such great kids. I was like, and I know they're 21 years old. And once upon a time when I was 18, 21 was like, wow, man, they're up there. Now I'm in my mid forties and I'm like, those little whippersnappers, 21 years old, those kids. But the older that I get, you know what I enjoy more? I enjoy more being able to be a blessing than to be blessed. It, it blesses me to be a blessing. I, I love to be an encouragement to other people. I love to lift other people up. If someone's struggling, I love to, to pray with them, pray for them. It, it, it blesses me more to be a blessing than to show up and say, okay, what you got for me? And, and honestly, if, it, it's, if we all would change our mindset on why we show up on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or on a special event, we would show up and say, hey, I'm, I want to see who can I bless today? You know what, when you get up on a Sunday morning and you're, oh, I was, eight, I was out late last night and I'm so tired and I, oh man, I'd just rather sleep and I heard there's a quarter-sized thunderstorm going to come by later and I'm sure that would hinder me from getting to church, so I might as well just stay in bed and I would just rather say, hey, if you would change your mindset instead of like, oh, well, you know, I only got eight and a half hours of sleep last night, I must have at least 11 in order to function as a, as a functioning human. Uh, if you change your mindset about church and like, there is somebody at church today that I can be a blessing to. 
And I don't know who they are yet. I don't know who needs it. I'm going to go and I'm going to be like Sherlock Holmes and I'm going to find who is it that needs a blessing today? Who is it that I can speak something into their life, be an encouragement or a challenge to them? Who is it that I can show up and I can speak to? And and whatever that word is that the Lord gave me this week and my personal devotions, because I was reading my Bible and and God shared something with me and uh, there's somebody, he gave it to me for a reason because what he shared with me, it doesn't really apply to anything I'm going through right now. And maybe it's for something later. Maybe it's something he gave me because next week I'm going to need it. Or or maybe he gave it to me on Tuesday because he knew on Sunday I was going to be at church and that person that's going through something, they're going to need to hear what the Lord gave me on Tuesday. Hey, if we changed our mind about why we show up for church, oh, it, it would make it a lot easier to get up on a Sunday morning. It wouldn't matter if you stayed out late Saturday night doing, uh, going down to Vernon for a wedding and, and, and having to drive late at night to get back. It wouldn't matter. You'd wake up and say, I can't wait to get to church because I want to be a blessing to somebody today. Uh, listen, why do we come to church? I, I'm passionate about the church. I'm passionate about church attendance. And I know, and I know there's certain things that I'll preach on that folks could sit back and maybe be a little cynical and be like, okay, preacher, you're the pastor. Okay. You're paid to tell us that we need to be here because if we're not here, you're not paid to tell us that we need to be here. And, And listen, Hey, it's got nothing to do with that. You see, when I'm passionate and saying you should come to church, That's a message I've been preaching for years, and I've only been a pastor for six, and it's been 20-something I've been preaching that message. And so, listen, I I am passionate about church attendance. And we've we've talked about this over the years being here, but even in our family, like, uh, when it comes to our family, like, our kids, no Sunday morning that I can recall in the history of our children have they ever got up and said, are we going to church today? Because it's not a question. They know. We're going to church today. That doesn't mean that they get up with smiles on their faces and ready and raring to go every Sunday morning. No, our kids are sinners just like your kids, okay? Uh, But they know that's not a question. I've told you before, Kyle was born on a Tuesday and on Sunday he was in church. Uh, Haley was born on a Tuesday and on Sunday she was in church. Ryan was born on a Monday and he was a little harder. It took two weeks to get him to church, okay? But as soon as he got out of the NICU and he was ready, we got him to church. That's just all they've ever known. They've been in church. And we've raised them not just because it's what we say, but because this is what is right. This is what God calls us to do. Now, it's a message I've preached for years even before being a pastor. It's a message we've lived out even before I was a pastor. But now, as a pastor, I've seen the effects in families when church and the Bible and a faithfulness to the Lord falls by the wayside. I've seen the effects on families whenever that is not a priority on being close to the Lord. I've seen the effect on families when, when uh, parents make church optional and then their children, it's not even an option. You see, I've seen those effects as a pastor. And so I want to encourage you today that church is important. Church attendance is important. Is church attendance the end all and be all and fix all of everything that ails you? No. Well, you know, my wife and I were fighting this week. I guess if I show up to church, all our problems will be be solved. No, if you're a knucklehead and you're mean and you're just rude and you're horrible, just showing up to church probably ain't going to fix that. You need to get right with God and then get right with your spouse, okay? But if you come here, you're going to hear me say, stop being a knucklehead, get right with God and get right with your spouse. And so will it be the end all fix all of everything? If you get your kids to church, will they be the most perfect children, straight A students, MVP on every ball team they play on? No. But you get your kids to church and there's a whole lot more likelihood that they're going to turn out right. And there's a whole lot more likelihood that they're going to walk with the Lord than if you never take them to church. If you never take them to church, what are the chances they're going to walk with the Lord? Yeah, I've heard people say over the years, listen, you don't have to be at church to worship God. Absolutely. Absolutely. My goodness, I ride around on a lot more sometime, which I found out. Uh, so Kyle's working at camp this summer, so he's busy all during the week. And then the weekends come, and he's got like a day and a half at home. And then he's gone, and then it rains, so there's no yard work done there. Ryan couldn't do yard work. We had rain. Well, now Ryan's leaving for a week, and I'm like, my yard needs to be mowed, kids. What y'all going to do about it? They're going to leave on me. So I'm going to be riding on a lawnmower probably tomorrow afternoon, weather permitting. So I'm going to be out there mowing the yard. You know what? I can worship the, worship the Lord mowing the yard. I've done that many a times. Man, I'll have, I always have earbuds in, and they'll, they'll 
there'll be something come on. Man, there's been a few times where I've shed a tear or two on the, on the, on the lawnmower because there was just something blessed my heart. And I started worshiping God on the lawnmower. I, don't, I wasn't at church, but I was having church. I, I wasn't at church. I wasn't with you guys, but I was still worshiping. I, I get up early in the morning. I sit at my desk in my office. My family's still snoozing on the other end of the house. And there are days where I'm sitting there studying and the Lord shows me something. And I just worship the Lord all by myself. Can you worship somewhere other than church? Absolutely. But you know what? When you read the New Testament and you look at the writings of Paul, what has God ordained? He has instituted for us to gather a, a, a method, a, 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 a tool, a, a, a place for us to gather together to worship Him, to grow our faith, to encourage one another. He's given us the church. And as we read Scripture, it doesn't seem that it's optional. I mean, some that would say, I can worship God anywhere. Yes, you can, but that's not the end all. Like, it's not, well, I worshiped him the other day in my office, so I don't have to come to church. It doesn't seem, as I read the New Testament, that there's like multiple choice. Where would you prefer to worship? At home, at church, in the car, you know, choose one. No, it's more like, it's one of those, you know, I, I, I hate these kind of tests. At work, there's certain trainings we have to do sometimes. All right, I, I have a few different certification things I've had to go through at work. And, and, and so they'll give you a scenario. You know, you had to watch these boring videos, read these boring texts. You had to do all this. And then they'll give you a scenario. You know, Bob's doing this and Sue's doing this and Sally's doing this. And pick all the right answers of how they need to respond. I'm like, there's six different things here. And, and the thing is, if they just change one word in there, it's a wrong answer. And so you're like, pick all. Well, there's six things here, and all of the above is not an option. So I'm like, this one and this one and this one. And then it's like, sorry, that's wrong. It's supposed to be all of them. Why didn't you give me a pick all as a choice then? But listen, hey, God, he doesn't say A, B, C, or D. Which one of these places can you worship? It actually is a, a B, C, D, and then E is all of the above. We can worship God anywhere. But if the question was, which one of these has God ordained as the place where we are to gather together and he has commanded us not to forsake the assembling of, oh, we're going to say, well, that's the church. Over in Hebrews chapter 10, there's a verse that's used quite often by pastors. Hebrews 10, 25, and it says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much, I mean, there's this emphasis put on the end, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hey, listen, we are, we are not to forsake the assembling of, the, of ourselves together. As a matter of fact, I think I missed a part there. In the middle it says, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hey, listen, we have an exhortation there in Hebrews chapter 10. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Pop quiz. Do you think the assembling of ourselves together refers to the ball game? No. Do you think the assembling of ourselves together refers to a wedding? A joyous occasion. The Bible was mentioned last night. I, I, I challenged the, the couple with Scripture. But that's not what that verse refers to. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, could it be a family gathering or a work gathering? That's not what he's talking about. As you study Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. He's speaking of the gathering together of a body of believers in a place that is called church. If we just looked at verse verse 25 of Hebrews chapter 10 that would be enough to say we need to be here but I love to look at the passage as a whole back up a few verses because actually it, it, punctuation is important and I know some of you that are teachers you'll appreciate that you're like yes exactly preach it preacher uh, punctuation matters uh, listen uh, if you back up Hebrews 10 25 is actually the end of a sentence it's not its own sentence it's the end of a sentence and it's the end of a longer thought I mean, even if we just backed up one verse to verse 24, you back up to back up one verse and, and, and we're told there and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Hebrews 10, 25, then forsake not the assembling of yourselves together and exhorting one another. You see, church attendance isn't just about me. What can I get? what's the preacher got for me and what's someone going to say to me and how can I be blessed? It's about what can I do for somebody else? One another. Let me bless you and you bless me and we'll bless them and one another. But we're told forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Listen, most of us go to work every day. I have a day job too. This isn't my only job and most of you know that. 
I have a day job too. And many, when you go to work, you are not surrounded by church people. I, I do have the benefit of my, my day job. I work for a church software company. So all day I'm dealing with people that are working at a church, calling about our software. I'm my coworkers who are working in their churches and stuff. So I do have the benefit, for the most part, that I'm surrounded by Christians all day, every day. But many don't. And you go to work, and at work, you're not getting the encouragement to read your Bible. And you're not getting challenged by, hey, what did, what did the Lord show you at church this past Sunday? And you're going to church, and you're not being encouraged to do things that God would have you to do. Instead, you're hearing things that you don't need to hear. And you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't stand hearing some of the ways they talk. And, and you might even work with some folks, that, though they're not believers. Maybe you would say, well, I mean, they're pretty good people. And we talked about good last week. But, but you would say, Man, I mean, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty good people. They're just not godly people. And so if your only exposure to people are your good people at, at work, but they never encourage you for the Lord, and you decide not to show up for church, then where are you getting that encouragement from the Lord? And so we, 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 we have to have a job. We have to make money. We have to pay the bills. And so we, we many times are out in a, a secular workforce, and, and we're surrounded by things of the world all the time. We've got to have somewhere where we can come and get recharged and refreshed. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Over the years, I've, I've seen many professing believers that have just made church optional. And when confronted on it, oftentimes they, they kind of get this attitude. They get this attitude like, listen, well, I know so-and-so, and they're in your church. And they're there all the time. But I know them on Monday. Hey, hey, may that not be said about you. I hope it's not. But, you know, yeah, they may be there every time the doors are open, but I've seen them on Monday and on Tuesday. Whew. Hey, listen, I read my Bible, and I'm nice to people, and that's more than they do. Hey, listen, may that not be, may you not be that hindrance to somebody, but if, if that's somebody you know, that, that has that attitude, and look, I get it, you're here. You're like, why are you telling us, chill, preacher? We're here. <laughs> you talking about being at church? We're at church. Why are you fussing at us? All right. Hey, maybe you're here today, but it ain't, it, you ain't usually here, so this is for you. All right? I wrote this before I knew who was here. I wasn't like, all right, who's here? Oh, this is the week we're doing this one. No. Hey, listen. Not only that, though, maybe somebody's going to hear this later and like, well, let's just hear what that crazy preacher had to say this week. And then they're going to hear, oh, I should have been at church. Okay. Hey, but listen, sometimes folks will have that attitude. Well, I know so-and-so, and I'm better than they are, even though I stay at home. Two things about that. One, you and I are not going to answer for so-and-so, but we are going to answer for us. And when I stand before God someday, because I talked a few weeks back about two appointments we must keep, death and judgment. And when I stand before the Lord in judgment and he says, all right, here's my commands, here's my word, here's what I told you to do, here's what you knew was right, here's what you were responsible for, let's see how you did and he says, well, what about church attendance? You know I love my church, and you know that I, had, I, I, I gave my, my, my life for the church. And I, I, I talked about it throughout the New Testament about how important the church is to me, and you chose not to go. If in that moment you're like, well, I would have, but Lord, so-and-so, I guarantee in that moment your mouth's going to get shut. Because the Lord's going to say, no, 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 I'll deal with so-and-so. I'm here to talk about you. I gave you a command, and you chose to disobey. Hey, if you're a parent, you know. Kids can come up with some excuses. And some of them are just out there. <laughs> like You're like, did, did you fall? Did you get hit in the head? What happened? Like, Why are you talking like that? That doesn't even make sense. That's probably how the Lord's going to look at some of us. As we say, well, you see, here's the thing, God. Uh, I would have been faithful, but... And he's like, no, that's not going to fly. So one, we're not going to answer for so-and-so. But two, you know what? I want so-and-so, and I don't have anybody in mind. So if you're like, oh, I wonder who he's talking about. <laughs> I wonder who so-and-so is. It's them. It's, I know it's them. Some of you wives are like, he's talking to you. No, 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 stop, okay? Seriously. But maybe, oh, so-and-so. Here, here's what I would say about them that are being the devil on Monday and Tuesday, but they're here all the time on Sunday and Wednesday. Hey, yeah, they may be the devil and they need to get right. And so you know what they're going to get when they get here on Sunday and on Wednesday? They're going to get the truth. And they're going to hear the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so that, that, that word of God that I'm going to preach and others are going to preach and Sunday school teachers are going to teach, they're going to give that to them. And that old 
devil of a person that on Monday and Tuesday act like the devil, but they show up on Sunday, they're going to keep getting the word of God. And God's word can pierce that heart and convict them of their sin. And oh, so and so that you're using as an example for why you shouldn't come to church because they're coming someday. They may hear it and it actually it might actually do something in their lives and they change and they're not the old so and so they used to be. And so don't use somebody else as an excuse for why you're not faithful. You obey. Someone shared a video this week, and it said this. Uh, it was a lady speaking. She said, if you make church attendance negotiable to your kids, do not be surprised when God is negotiable to them, too. Hey, if your kid had a choice, if you said, hey, listen, do you just want to sleep in tomorrow, or do you want to get up and go to church? There's a good chance, as sweet and perfect as your children are, there's a good chance your kids are going to be like, I can sleep in? Yeah, I want to do that. I mean, my kids, I, I, and I remember, I used to do this when I was a kid, but like my body hurt. Like when they sleep to like 11 and 12 because they had a long week at camp, my body hurts just thinking about laying in bed that long. Like 11 o'clock, they're still asleep. 12 o'clock, they're still asleep because we, when they've had a long week, but not on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they would like to catch up on sleep, but they don't ever ask if that's an option on Sunday. But see, if we made it negotiable, you know what? Sure, they'd want to sleep in. Sure, we, we, you know, here's the thing. A lot of parents will let kids stay up till 1, 2 o'clock on a Saturday because, hey, it's a Saturday. And then wonder why their kids can't get up on Sunday for church. You see, we must not make it optional. Would that, would that we had more people like Joshua who would stand up and say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Years ago, I think it was, at a, I think it was on a Father's Day, I preached a message from that. And I said, we need some men to stay up and say, hey, in my house and you know with a little oomph to it you know what i'm saying hey 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 in my house we're gonna serve the lord in my because i mean you'll say that about other things like oh you're gonna try to talk to me like that in my house i don't say you don't talk you may say something like that. why don't we say hey in my house we're gonna serve the lord man w wouldn't it be great if we had some families like that that would take that stand like joshua did now i know i've gone a few minutes and i ain't even asked a question yet you know, like, I thought this was Gaskins asking. I thought we were asking the questions. He ain't even asked the question yet. Here's how we got here. There was a question submitted. You may even, as I say the question, you're going to be like, I still don't see why we're where you, how you just went off. It's somewhat connected. But the question was submitted. And it, it said this, again, uh, just different questions are asked. And it said, why is Sabbath on Saturday, but we have church on Sundays? And a lot of Christians will work on Saturday, but not on Sunday. And so this morning, again, it's talking about the church. This morning, we're going to bring you a message entitled Sabbath or Sunday. Sabbath or Sunday. And we're going to start in Exodus chapter 20 this morning. Exodus chapter 20. I say start, and I know I've been going for about 20 minutes and I'm sweating. All right, so I know that start is kind of a weird word to use right now. But we're going to start in Exodus 20. Don't get discouraged. Don't get worried when I say start. That doesn't mean that now we're going to start the clock and I got another 45 minutes. Maybe. All right. Exodus chapter 20, beginning of verse number one. The Bible says this And God spake all these words, saying, God spake these words. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down, bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, sh thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus chapter 20 is where we read what we know as the Ten Commandments. 
I, I just read you the first four of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If you look at the Ten Commandments, they're really divided into four commandments about our relationship with God, that vertical relationship. And then our six commandments, our relationship with mankind, those horizontal commandments. The first 11 verses refer to our relationship with God. And there at the end uh, of those is thou shalt, uh, thou shalt not, or rather, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, my goal this morning in answering the question that was, that was asked, the Sabbath versus Sunday, and my goal is, one, to talk about the importance of the original Sabbath and how that some of the principles of that carried over into the New Testament church, even though the day has shifted. And there's a reason why the day shifted, and I'll address that in a moment. But to answer this question, we're going to look at it in two parts. And again, all of my talk about being faithful to church and church attendance, it's because of what the Sabbath is all about or what the Sunday worship is all about. So what was the Sabbath? We were probably somewhat familiar with the word Sabbath. If you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, you've heard the word Sabbath. And in addition to that, it's mentioned many times in Scripture. The first time this word Sabbath is mentioned is actually in Exodus chapter number 16. In Exodus 16, Sabbath is mentioned for the first time. It's a word that simply means to rest. So the Sabbath is a day of rest. It, while it was mentioned for the first time in Exodus 16, it actually, the principle, the idea behind it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter number 2. Our first week we were in Genesis chapter 1 as we answered our first question. But in Genesis 2 we read this in verses 2 and 3. It says, and on the seventh day, the so on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, as God stepped back, he had spent six days creating all that we see, all that we don't even see, but he had created everything. And it says he did that in six days, as we spoke about a few weeks ago. I believe it to be six literal days. It says in the evening and the morning were one day, and the evening and the morning were two days. So it just makes sense based on the language that is used that it was six literal days. God spoke everything into existence. And then it says, and on the seventh day, he stepped back from all of his work and he rested. And then we get over to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 16, Sabbath is mentioned for the first time, but in Exodus chapter 20, it's given as a command. And in that command, it, as God is delivering this to Moses, who will then deliver it to the people, God says, it's like back at creation, where on the seventh day, I rested. That's what you're supposed to do. And so he lays out this principle of the seventh day, which is Saturday on a calendar. Oftentimes we'll think of the weekend and it's Saturday, Sunday. But as most of us know, Sunday is actually the beginning of a new week. But on the calendar, Saturday is the seventh day. And so Saturday was the day that the Lord established as the Sabbath. It was a day of rest, but also a day of worship. Because he says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. So it wasn't just about kicking your feet up and, oh, man, it's been a long week. I've worked hard. Today, I get to rest. That's not all it was about, though that was part of what it was about. But it was a time, it was a day that was to be kept holy. It was a day for rest, but also, and more importantly, a day for worship. The only work that could be done on the Sabbath was that which was absolutely necessary. And here's what I mean by that. <coughs> If you were in your house on the Sabbath and you heard some weird noise coming from your animals and you looked out and one of your animals had fallen into a ravine, you didn't have to say, well, it's the Sabbath. I hope they'll be okay till tomorrow. No, you could go out and you could rescue the animal. You could save the animal from the ravine. It's just you couldn't go out and be like, well, I mean, I got some time. I'm just going to go ahead and work all the flock today and I'm going to go ahead and uh, take care of everything that I didn't get to do yesterday. I'm going to do all that today. No. You could do that which was necessary, but you couldn't work at large. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, the idea of Sabbath or the word Sabbath is, is mentioned actually throughout the Old Testament and throughout the first part of the New Testament, which is important. You see, Sabbath is mentioned 92 times in the Old Testament, the word Sabbath. 
It is mentioned 92 times. 39 of those are in the books of the law, specifically Exodus through Deuteronomy. Now, in the New Testament, Sabbath is mentioned 55 times. In the New Testament, 55 times. 54 of those are in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then in Acts. So 54 times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. One time after Acts. Much of the reason why the Sabbath is mentioned in the Gospels, though, when we read about the Sabbath, oftentimes what was happening was Jesus showed up at a synagogue or showed up at a, a pool or showed up somewhere and healed somebody. And then what happened? The Pharisees jumped up. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. You can't heal them. It's the Sabbath. You can't do that. It's the Sabbath. And so most of the time when we look in the New Testament, in the Gospels, oftentimes Sabbath is being used as kind of a hindrance to the work of God. It is a hindrance to what Jesus had come to do. And so it was most of the time the Pharisees would come and they would throw around the word Sabbath. And here's the, here's the thing with the Pharisees. And again, if you've been here a while, you've heard me talk about this. God gave his commands. We read the Ten Commandments. And honestly, it's pretty easy. Like, I mean, I, not necessarily easy to keep. We've all broken them, but easy to understand what they mean. Now shall keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember it. Keep it holy. Don't have any other gods. Don't have any graven images. Don't worship anyone. Don't take the, Lord name, uh, the, the Lord's name in vain. Uh, uh, don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. I mean, these are pretty easy to understand, though, in our sinfulness, we've broken them. Um, but the Pharisees took those Ten Commandments and others and said, okay, here's the thing. You guys are too dumb to know what God meant, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to break it down for you. All right, so when he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, here's what he really meant. And they would go so far to say, like, you can walk X number of steps on the Sabbath and you're not working. You walk one more step and it's work and you're in sin now. Uh, you can do this on the Sabbath because that's okay, but you can't do this on the Sabbath because that would be... And they, the Pharisees broke it down to where pretty much nobody could truly keep the Sabbath because what God gave them as a, as a thing of rest... Can you imagine? I mean, if I was like, okay, listen, when you show up for church today, okay, look, first you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do And I just laid out all these rules. Like the, the day of worship and day of rest, you'd come in and be like stressed out. Like, wait, did I go right foot first when I walked in? Or was I left, wait, oh, what did he say? And do I sit here or do I cross my legs or not? Do I stand? Do I sit? Do I... You'd be so stressed out on all the stuff, you wouldn't be able to enjoy the service. And that's what the Pharisees had done. They had made this day of rest so stressful on people. And they were there to call them out. Ooh, 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 ooh. Do you see what they did? Do you see what they did? They broke the Sabbath. Shame on you. So they made it so stressful. But in the New Testament, that's really what we know of the Sabbath. Something that's important to remember when we ask the question, why don't we observe the Sabbath? Because today's Sunday, and we said the Sabbath was the seventh day, which was Saturday. Yesterday, I didn't do a lot of work, but I did some work. And I went out, and it wasn't a day of, quote-unquote, rest and worship. I didn't observe the Sabbath day yesterday, but yet Sunday is set aside, and here I am with you worshiping. Here I am uh, preaching the Word of God. Here I am. This is a day where we focus on the Lord, so why don't we observe the Sabbath? It's important to remember that the Sabbath was established as part of the Old Testament Jewish law. I, I don't know everyone's background here, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say, if not all, the vast majority of all in here are Gentiles. Maybe someone in here is Jewish by your, your background, you know, but most, if not all of us, are Gentiles. God gave the law to the Jews in the Old Testament for them to follow as his people. In the New Testament, we are under a new covenant. We're not under the law. As a matter of fact, the last Sunday night, we finished up a study of the book of Galatians. And the whole point of Galatians were that the Jews had come to these believing Gentiles in the area of Galatia and said, well, now you've got to keep the law. In order for this to be real, in order for your faith in Christ to really be real, you've also got to keep the law. And Paul came through and said, no, no. Like you Jews that grew up under the law, you don't even keep it that well. And you're going to go to these Gentiles who've never been under Jewish law and you're going to say, now keep the law? No. So why would we then be under that which God gave to the Jewish people in the Old Testament? 
we're not in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. We've never been under the law. It's never been part of our faith. That was for them. And so God commanded a Sabbath day in the Old Testament. Now, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Those are the Ten Commandments. Uh, if we don't have to keep that one, do we have to keep the others? Does that mean that that person that cut me off now, I can go kill him because I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments? Okay, no. Please hear me. No. That is not what that means. And if the name came to mind just now, no. Listen, God gave his people some commandments. But you know, there are certain principles and commands that even though they were in the Jewish law, they also have carried other into, over into other law. And thou shalt not murder was not just intended for the Jews. Thou shalt not murder is intended for all of us. That's God's law for mankind. That's man's line, uh, law for mankind. And thou shalt only have one God, only, only worship the one true God. That's God's law across the board, not just for the Jews. But remember the Sabbath, that was a thing for them, for them to keep in the Old Testament. Now, the principles still apply, a day of rest and worship. But it shifted, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Again, notice that the word Sabbath appears 55 times in the New Testament, but only one time past the book of Acts. And that's actually in the book of Colossians. In Colossians 2, 16, Paul says that the believers, which were Gentiles, should not let anybody, and he's referencing the Jews, judge them for not keeping the holy days or the Sabbath. So the only time that the Sabbath is mentioned past the book of Acts is when Paul tells the Gentile believers, stop worrying about what everyone else thinks about whether you keep the holy days or the Sabbath. To any Christian who says, no, we absolutely should keep the Sabbath on Saturday. Number one, if, if there are some and there are some that feel that an observance of Saturday Sabbath is the way to go. There's nothing wrong with that. Except there are some, I will say this as I was doing some reading, there are some that tie the keeping of the Sabbath with salvation. And if you keep a different day of worship, then you're not saved. That's wrong. That's a false teaching. But if there's some group that says we 100% believe Jesus Christ is the only way, but we just feel like that day of rest and worship, the Sabbath should still be observed. It's, I can't see where it's wrong. But if they say we, everyone has to keep the Sabbath, just like the Old Testament, my question would be this. Do you keep all of the Jewish holidays also? Do you observe Yom Kippur? Do you observe, observe Rosh Hashanah? Do you observe uh, Purim? Do you observe and all of the others? Because if you insist on an observance of the Old Testament Sabbath, then you also should insist on the Old Testament observance of all of the feasts and all of the holidays. But you see, Paul in Colossians 2.16 says, no, 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 Gentiles, you that have placed your faith in Christ, but you're not part of the Jewish nation. You've never been under the Jewish law. You've never kept the Jewish feast. You've never kept the Jewish Sabbath. You're not under that now. Don't let any Jew judge you of that. So to recap, what was the Sabbath? To recap, the Sabbath was observed by Jews on the seventh day of the week, Saturday. It was a day of rest and worship that had been first modeled by the Lord when he rested from creation on the seventh day. The Jews were commanded in their law, most famously the Ten Commandments, to remember this day and its holy observance. However, after the book of Acts, it's only mentioned that one other time in the New Testament when Paul told Gentile believers not to let Jews judge them for not keeping Jewish holy days and the Sabbath. So that's the Sabbath. And perhaps some of you are in here like, okay, now I know more about the Sabbath than I ever thought I needed to know. Well, good. You learned something today. Let's look at the next part of that question. Why do we meet for church on Sunday? So what about the Sabbath? There you go. What was the Sabbath? That's it. Now, why do we meet for church on Sunday? Because the Sabbath was the seventh day. It was Saturday. And so it was something commanded for the Jews to observe, a, a day of rest and worship. But I don't think the day carried over, but the principle carried over into the New Testament church. It's just observed on a different day, Sunday, the first day of the week. So instead of ending the week with rest and worship on Saturday, we begin the week with rest and worship on Sunday. To understand why this day, the day was shifted from Saturday to Sunday, I want to read a few verses to you. And you'll see probably a common theme before these four verses. Matthew chapter 28, verse number one says this. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first 
day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Mark chapter 16, verse number 2, And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Luke 24, verse number 1, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. John chapter 20, verse number 1, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. I just read you a verse from each of the four Gospels, and each of them referred to something that happened on the first day of the week. Any guesses what that event was that took place on the first day of the week that's referred to at the end of each of these four Gospels? It was the resurrection of Christ. Our Lord and Savior who had been dead and buried on the third day, which was the first day of the week, the Sunday, rose from the grave. Now why is that important? A few more passages of Scripture. Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. I like this verse, and I'll, I'll explain more why here in just a moment. Acts 20, verse 7 says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples, that just means followers, not the twelve disciples, followers at large, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. That gives me some liberty right there, I feel. He continued his sermon until midnight. Don't keep reading in that passage because you'll see one person fell asleep and fell out a window. <laughs> we're not going to focus on that, but he preached until midnight. So when you start to think, and man, the preacher's going a little long today, is it midnight yet? All right, I rest my case. Your Honor. Okay. But we see there, it says they had gathered together. Now there was breaking of bread, there was fellowship. There was preaching of the word. Paul opened up the word. And when was it? It says and on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says this. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. In larger context, what he's saying is bring together your tithes and offerings on the first day of the week. He's like, don't wait for me to get there. Like, you guys should be doing this anyway. Y'all are at church. Don't wait. Like, oh, Brother Paul's here. Let's all get some money together. He's like, on the first day of the week, bring your tithes and offerings to the church. One more verse I want to share with you. Revelation 1.10 says this. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Listen, as you read the New Testament, go ahead, study it this week, read it, challenge me on this. I'm fine with that. You will not find a verse that says, Thou shalt meet together on Sunday as a New Testament church for worship. Because there's not a command to meet together on Sunday specifically for worship. However, it does seem, based on the model of the early church, after Christ rose on the first day of the week, they then modeled their worship on the first day of the week. They would use the first day of the week to, again, every week celebrate what Jesus had done. And in the early church, I mean, some of them, it was weeks months earlier hey we're, we're meeting together on sunday because you know can you imagine because it was just a few weeks ago jesus rose from the dead on a sunday so let's get together and let's just celebrate that again a few months later you know they're again you know for months and months they're just remembering this we're meeting together on sunday why are we doing it on sunday again why not saturday because it was on sunday that jesus rose don't you mean oh that's right that's right and so that seemed to be the 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 the, the uh tradition that stuck was that they would meet on sunday no longer, especially the Gentile churches, no, they were not under the Jewish law. They were just under faith in Christ. And they were remembering that our Savior rose on the first day of the week. And so they gathered together then. The verse I gave you in Revelation, Revelation 1.10, John in his book of the Revelation said he, he was, he was uh, there in the Lord's day. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's the only place that, that phrase is used. Sometimes we'll talk about gathering together. We're going to church. You know, it's, it's the Lord's day. So we're going to gather together at church. In Scripture, that's the only place it's used. But you know what word he didn't use? Sabbath. I was in the Spirit on the Sabbath. Why wouldn't he have said Sabbath? I mean, because Sabbath was used 92 times in the Old Testament, 55 times in the New Testament. Why wouldn't John have just said Sabbath? Everyone knew what that was. Because it wasn't Saturday. He was talking about a different day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And so why do we meet on Sunday instead of Saturday? We follow the model set forth by the early New Testament church. 
Not necessarily due to a command to meet on Sunday, though we do have a command to meet together. But we follow their example of the early church. The closest to a command that we see is when Paul said that the church was to bring their offerings together on the first day of the week. I don't assume that he's telling them, now show up to church, drop off your offering, and then you go home, but come back for the service a different day of the week. It just makes sense that that was the day they came together as a church. That's when they were to bring their offerings. We, we see an example in Acts of the early church gathering together on the first day of the week. But, hey, if we really wanted to get Acts, like, follow their model, they also met every single day of the week in people's homes. So be grateful that that's not the tradition that stuck. And I say be grateful. I mean, I think it sounds pretty cool, but, you know, I understand. We all got a lot of things going on. But the settling on Sunday as the day to observe rest and worship had much to do with following the example of the early church. And so this morning, why don't we observe the Sabbath? And why do we meet on Sunday? We've seen here what Scripture lays out. And the most important takeaway this morning should be that we are to set aside a time for rest and for gathering together to worship. I can worship on the lawnmower tomorrow afternoon, weather permitting, but that's not the command to gather together for worship. To ignore these principles that are seen throughout Scripture, a principle to rest and worship, to, to ignore these principles it will lead to trouble in our lives. Our physical bodies must have rest in order to continue to function. Our spiritual lives must have a time of worship and instruction and fellowship in order to grow and thrive. I know the arguments that are made sometimes, though. It's tough to get to church on Sunday because we've got so much going on. And we had so much going on during the week, we couldn't, we couldn't get it all done. So we have to stay at home on Sunday to do the stuff that we couldn't get done. The rest of the week to that argument here's kind of where I, I fall I, I, I've told you before I, I love numbers and so we're gonna do something this morning I, I want to do something that Nikki's dad used to say to her and her sister and she hates it and so I figured why not throw that in this sermon we're gonna take this thing by the numbers that's what her dad used to say if, if they were mouthing off about something which I know you can't imagine but okay um, I'm sorry it was, it was more Michelle um, he would say something like, okay, let's just take this thing by the numbers. And she hated that. So it might get brought up occasionally in our marriage. Whatever. Don't, don't judge me. All right. You know, but yeah, she's over here. I judge you all the time for that. Uh, but in, in his philosophy, let's take this by numbers. I'm paying the rent or, you know, the, the mortgage. I pay for your car. I pay for the insurance. And you're going to use it how I say so. Well, let, let's take this by the numbers. Since it's, because some folks will say, I just don't have enough time. I, I can't be faithful to church because i got so much going on. I, 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 this really was mind-blowing to me years ago. There are 168 hours in the week. All right, we're about to do some math, so buckle up. Some of y'all are kicking your shoes off, getting ready to start counting toes, all right? There are 168 hours in a week. Let's say you, re you get to sleep eight hours a night, and I know... <laughs> I wish I got to sleep eight hours every night, but let's just for the sake of it, let's say we sleep eight hours a week, or eight hours, no, eight hours a week, that would be bad, eight hours a night. That leaves us with 112 hours that we are awake during any given week. Now let's say we put in our 40 hours, and let's say that we have to travel 10 hours round trip commute during the week. Take away another 50 hours. That leaves us with 62 hours in our week where we're not at work, and we're awake, 62 hours. I added up the amount of time that we spend at church. If you come for Sunday school and you stay for the Sunday morning service and you come back for Sunday night service, which we do have a Sunday night service at 5 o'clock on Sunday night, and if you show up for the meal on Wednesday night and you stay for the service on Wednesday night, if you do all of that, you know how much time that takes up? About six hours total. So when we do the math, we take this thing by the numbers. That leaves you with 56 hours for everything else. 56 hours for everything else and yet many will still say I just don't have time for church I, I, Let me rephrase that for you because I, I mean that I just don't have time for church Let me rephrase what you're really saying. Okay, let me be that little translator between what you said and what God hears I just don't have time for church. I Just don't have time to obey you God That that's a whole different way of seeing that I don't have time for church. I'm super busy 
I just don't have time to obey you, God. So I'm not going to be at church like you commanded me to. 56 hours left to do everything else. All your chores. I had yard work to do, so I had to stay home. I had this to do, so I had to stay home. I had the chores, hobbies. Hey, listen, and, and if you want to say I harp on this, that's fine. I'll harp on this. I've heard so many people say, you know, when we were coming up, we didn't have sports on Sundays. But yet there's so many families like, man, this, is, this stinks that they're having sports on Sundays. Oh, well, I guess we got to pack up and go to sports on Sundays. If every Christian who has their kids in sports and are skipping church on Sundays would say, no, we're not doing that. You know what eventually would happen? They'd stop having sports on Sundays. But what's happened is the world says, here's what we're going to do. And Christians, well, I guess we got to do it. And we just follow right along. Hey, if you don't want them to have sports on Sundays or whatever on Sundays, then stop participating in it. 56 hours to do whatever in the week. Our chores, our hobbies, our sporting activities, whatever. And we still say, don't have enough time. There's too much going on. Then let me just say this. Lovingly, kindly. You have too much going on. And if you quit some things, it will probably do you a lot of good. And I know if you show up for church faithfully, it would do you and your family a lot of good. I, again, I've seen the opposite. I've seen both ends of it. The families that show up faithfully, are they without problems? No. Are they without as many problems? Yes. The families that forsake the assembling of themselves together and make church optional and don't show up regularly, do they have problems? Yes. And are they, are they magnified? Yes. And so 56 hours to do everything. Maybe this week. If, if you showed up today and you're like, we barely showed up. We just happen to have time this week. But next week, probably not going to have time. We're super busy. All right, number one. Number one, you're talking to somebody who works two full-time jobs and other stuff and preaches, you know, I've got camp coming up next week. And I promise I'm on Lord willing, unless he strikes me down, that next Sunday after camp, I'm still going to be here, okay? And I, I'm going to go from camp preaching eight times that week to, to Saturday night coming up here and worshiping with the youth for youth revival. And I'm going to be exhausted. And then I'm going to show up Sunday morning to, to preach again for you guys, all right? I love the church, and I know how important it is. But I'm busy, too. But listen, if you're too busy for God, you're too busy you need to cut some things out. But here's what I would say. If you're one of those that says most weeks you're just too busy, I want you to do an experiment this week. you got your 56 hours. Again, you might have more than that. You might have a little bit less, but roughly. Take your 56 hours. Get you a piece of paper or put it on your phone or whatever. Every time you sit down to watch TV, start your stopwatch on your phone. And when you're finished, write it down. Do that for a week. Every time you pick up your phone or you're on the computer and you're just scrolling through social media, start your stopwatch. And when you stop, write it down. At the end of the week, tell me how much time you spent on the phone or, t on the, or the computer and how much time you spent watching TV. I promise you, when you add that up, it's going to probably be more than six hours. So when you say, I just don't have time, you do. You just don't have your priorities straight. A preacher shared that, shared something this week I wanted to share with you. And it was on social media as I was scrolling on social media. I saw he posted this. He says, the men who couldn't pray one hour with Jesus were the same men who had no trouble fishing all night. Priorities matter. If you want to go to church, you will. The reason you don't is because you don't want to. People do what they want to do. If I came up to you tomorrow and was like, hey, man, hey, lady, I got some tickets for the opening football game. Hey, college football's coming up just six or so weeks away. Praise God, roll tight. All right. And I were to come, I was like, hey, I got, I got 50 yard line opening day tickets, but I can't use them. Do you want them? Here's what's going to happen for most of us. We will move heaven and earth to make room for that game. Well, we had family coming in. I'll tell them to come in the next day instead. Well, I had some work that I needed to get done, but you know what? 
I'll try to do it the day before. Hey, I was supposed to work that day. I'm calling in sick. I'm going to lie to my boss and tell him I'm sick so that I can go to that football game, which shame on you for that. But, or, or hey, I'm going, to have, I'm going to ask somebody to trade days with me. We will move heaven and earth to make it to a game that we want to make it to, whether it's our kids' games or that team that you love. We will move heaven and earth to be there for that. Hey, we got, we got Sunday school uh, next Sunday at 9.45. We have service at 11. We have evening service at 5. We have dinner at 5.30 on Wednesday. We have a service at 6.15 on Wednesday. Uh, we hope to see you there. Oh, I just can't. It's been a busy week. I can't. I've got family coming in. It's busy. I'm, I, I got this. Or I got, fell behind on my chores. I gotta, I got, we will come up with every excuse. But you know what it's all about? Priorities. Even by priorities. You will do what you want to do. And again, I know. Some of you are like, I'm here. Dude. Remember this the next time you're like, I'm just going to sleep in. I'm too busy. I'm not going to show up. Show up not just because there may be something for you. Show up because there's somebody else that needs what you got this week. When you were reading your Bible, which you should be. When you were spending that personal worship time, which you should be, there's somebody sitting on the row with you or sitting down behind you, sitting somewhere around you. They, they need what you got this week. And that's why you're here. It's not about what you get. Yeah, you'll get something too. But it's the one another. What are we doing for somebody else? And so I know, they just asked you about the Sabbath and Sunday, man. Come on. The Sabbath and Sunday, though, it's about our time of rest and worship. And where do we worship? Together, church. We got to show up in order to do that. And so I hope you understand, man, my heart for the church, my passion for the church, it's God's command that we gather together. I hear people talk about things, you know, well, that church is struggling or this church is struggling and all. Listen, six months from now, we could be struggling. If we don't make church a priority. If you're here this morning and maybe you're like, this is new to me. I don't know what the big deal is. Or I mean, you're talking about Jesus raising from the dead. And I just, there's a lot of that I don't understand. If I could boil it down to just something simple, like why we gather to worship, why we gather to encourage each other, why we, why is church even a thing? It's because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, left heaven. He came to this earth as a man. He lived 30 plus years, a perfect life, never sinned. And then he was hung on a cross and he died. Not because he had done anything wrong, but he died on that cross to pay for the sins of mankind, including you and I. Because all of us have done wrong. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. But that's not the end of the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus died. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again on the first day of the week, which we observe when we show up on Sunday, the first day of the week. Jesus rose from the dead, victorious over death and sin, hell and the grave. And he offers you a gift. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, he says, I died for you so that you don't have to die in your sins. Will you receive this gift of forgiveness and of salvation? Will you be welcomed into my family? Listen, if you've never done that, I would love to talk to you and tell you more about that. I would love to tell you more about Jesus dying for your sins so that you could have a home in heaven. Don't leave today without talking to me or somebody else about that. It is so important. Let's stand and we'll pray. Let's stand. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge this morning. Thank you for the church. We gather today on a Sunday, the first day of the week, because historically, traditionally, this is what the church did. And why did they do that? They, they, they gathered together on Sunday, on the first day of the week, to remember that first day of the week when Jesus rose from the grave. God, thank you for sending your son. And thank you that he rose from the, de the dead. Thank you that he offers each of us the free gift of salvation. And if there's anyone here that's never received that, may they do that today. And Lord, maybe there's somebody here today that when it comes to church, they've been wishy-washy. When it comes to church, it's kind of, eh, if I make it, fine. If I don't, fine. Lord, speak to their hearts. And I, I would take it a step further. Lord, convict them. 
Show them that your church is important to you, and therefore it should be important to each of us. You've given us a command to gather together. So sitting at home on a Sunday, even watching on TV, it's not the same. It's not enough. You have commanded us to show up for one another. It's a day where we rest. Maybe it's not the, ex the extent that the Jews would rest on the Sabbath. It's not culturally the same for us, but still we have this time of rest. More importantly, we have this time of worship together with one another. We have our, our faith strengthened. We have our needs met. So I pray that you would speak to hearts today and help each of us to see the importance of your church to you and how important it should be to us. We just thank you, Lord. Thank you for the church. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.